Welcome back to the C Morning Show on C Today. This seems like a serious topic, but I think it is a very important one, especially as parents or um, siblings of young people. For some children and youth, self-harm can be quite addicting. Not quite, but can become addicting. And since hurting themselves seems like the only viable coping mechanism that they can do at the time when facing various problems. It's kind of disturbing, isn't it, when you mm. imagine a child doing uh, self-harm to themselves. Now, uh, children can have a complex relationship with self-harm, which can manifest itself in different forms. It often happens during times when they're coping with uh, various emotions, such as anger, fear, anxiety, or even depression. And in addition, self-harm can also aggravate their emotional problems, leading them to feel even worse about themselves. Yes. Um, what can we do as parents uh, to try to understand and treat our children when they're harming themselves? And how, what are the indications? How can we spot that sometimes? Um, even when they're a little bit older, they tend to get more difficult. They're getting better at hiding it. And to find out more, we're now connected with clinical psychologist Rachel Boniman. Good morning, Rachel. Thank morning, you for Rachel. being with us this morning. Hi, good morning, guys. Hi, Thanks good morning. for inviting me again here i know for a morning show this seems like a very serious topic but it's serious and it's the reality especially in uh, teenagers and uh, you know children could you explain more please about the definition of self-harm itself yes definitely so self-harm is the act of deliberately inflicting pain and damage on one's own body so it most often refers to cutting, burning, scratching, or other forms of external injury. It can, however, include internal or emotional harm too, such as um, consuming toxic amounts of alcohol, mm. drugs, or maybe even deliberately participating in unsafe sex. Okay. You know, so putting yourself in a dangerous situation. We mentioned uh, earlier in that lead there where uh, different emotions can, can lead to this, like anxiety or mm -hmm. anger. What, I, I'm still having trouble getting, wrapping my head around how uh, feeling these emotions could just force somebody to inflict uh, kind of harm on themselves. Like, are they upset with themselves or what's happening? The bigger question for me would be, how does inflicting the pain get rid or become the coping mechanism yes. as a solution? Good point. So individuals who self-injure um, may feel that doing so, you know, the cutting, mm. helps release the pent-up feelings of anxiety, of anger, mm. or sadness. Um, and most of them would take it in as like a, you know, as you said earlier, like a coping mechanism because they don't know what to do with that amount of anger, for example. They would, you know, cut themselves as a way to as a desperate way to let it out right mm. but obviously evidence find that it is a very very short-term solution to their issues but you know sometimes children and young adolescents have a hard time understanding that and of course. we're here to help well so what what I, what age are we talking because if you talk about teenagers then i can imagine because you are going through like a plethora of emotions but how young can this start happening at um, I guess it depends. Mm. So we can't like pinpoint like an age right. because it also depends on, you know, if the children have any other factors that would, mm. you know, then lead to the self-harm or not. But um, me personally, I've worked with as young as like 13. Okay. And so I've known that um, the person have has done it like even younger, like maybe she done it like when she was 12 or okay. 11 even. Mm. Good to watch. Mm -hmm. Good to know. So you can start watching out for. And speaking of watching out for it, mm -hmm. what are what are some of the things that we should be looking out for as parents with, let's say, preteens or just adolescents in general? Uh, things, in, not just obviously the direct signs. If you see signs of harm, then it's pretty obvious. You're going to ask what happened to you. But what are some of the signs that you can look out for leading up to that? Mm -hmm. So it's going to be hard to detect, mm. as it's usually done in secret or in areas that's you know easy to hide but if you're you can definitely watch out for you know unexplained cuts burns or bruises or even when you ask them like oh what happened or if it's like a you know kind of like a suspicious reason then you might you might worry from there mm -hmm. um they might be you know keeping themselves covered wearing long sleeves avoiding you know swimming maybe because it's like uh, 
open, right. you know, mm-hmm. or they might be, you know, more withdrawn, more mm-hmm. isolated. They have a lower mood, or they have a habit of like expressing feelings of like uselessness, helplessness, things like that. They're all to be worried of. You know, I. Um, this is a tough one because this is probably the darkest part of my teen years is that I actually went through that when I was younger. Really? Yes. Um, and uh, I stopped at 14, but I had to get myself out of it because there was no communication um, from my parents that was, for me, I found comforting enough to, you know, to, to guide me through it. And you hid it from Yes, me. and I hid it because... There was, you know, the communication style back then was different. Mm-hmm. Accusations or just deflecting it, denying it to completely something different. When you start seeing these signs in your children, what is the best way or the, the safest way to communicate with them to let them know that this is something that we can help them with? Because, you know, at that age, right, um, especially children, they can be very stubborn. They're going through so many things so many um, untapped emotions suddenly and everything's so overwhelming. And um, how can we get through there? Because the barriers are just too many. Mm -hmm. So one of the first steps um, for parents is to have a conversation, but don't bring up the self-harm right away. Okay. So Mm -hmm. you want to let them know like, hey, um, what's up? Um, I'm here for you if you need anything. And if they do like start talking about you know some of their issues you want to make sure that you're not judging them or Mm -hmm. putting them down and you might even say like hey you love them and you know that will never change no matter what happens um you want to show that you're prepared to listen when they're ready um you know you can encourage them by you know if you need anything you can just text me or give me a note um, or even offer them like if they would rather speak to someone else, like a therapist, for example, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. or a psychologist, because sometimes it's easier to for them to speak to a you know, fashion yes, yes. their mother, father, for example. Right. Um, and you want to encourage them to, you know, maybe build some more positive long-term solutions to it, like. Um, exercising is a good mm-hmm. is one that is effective right or maybe even like mindfulness or other activities like that okay mm-hmm. because um i you know mm-hmm. i had a completely misconception of self-harm because i would have assumed mm-hmm. uh incorrectly obviously that self-harm was kind of like a cry for help like you need attention or you need mm-hmm. but if you're hiding the fact that you're you know inflicting self-harm then obviously that's not mm-hmm. it at all um and you know what's scary is uh, the thought that this could lead to something further. So, could self-harm lead to something much worse, such as thoughts of suicide? I would say not necessarily. Okay. So, self-injury can look like attempted suicide. Right. And some who self-harm do ultimately on to attempt suicide. But many people who intentionally hurt themselves are not suicidal. Okay. So these are called non-suicidal self-injury, mm. NSSI. So rather they're simply taking extreme measures to distract themselves, you know, or an attempt to soothe their, you know, depression, their yeah. anger, their sadness. But still, you know, however, self-harm can still result in an accidental death. Okay, but it is. very counterintuitive, isn't it, to think that you uh, conflict, uh, inflicting self-harm to like soothe yourself. I mean, that's like completely opposite. Of the that. feeling is control, I think. Yeah. Is that what it is? I don't know. I remember it as control because when you're a teenager, nothing is within your control. Um, parents control your daily lives, mm. parents control everything and... Um, but you just want to have some of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just want to have that control and right. because you're going through so much and there's a different culture. How would you, what would you tell parents and, you know, as just, just advising them? Uh, is there a way to prevent that? What kind of environment do you think is a safe enough space for the children to be able to grow, um, you know, not having to reside to that kind of mm-hmm. coping mechanism, basically? So definitely building communication is very important. So, you know, in your everyday life, try not to be too judgmental or provide negative responses, especially on moments where your children open up to you. 
-hmm. especially in adolescence because you know as they're growing up they're less and less open to you mm. yeah. um, another tip is to you know you can start pointing out the positive things in their life um, or you can you know maybe do activities like um, collaging with photos of with friends or family mm. you know pointing out like who's your role model pointing out the positive things is very effective you can help them do mindfulness or imagery there's a lot of mindfulness activities on youtube such as using senses so using mm. your sight your hearing your smell so it brings them to the here and now rather to the you know maybe negative emotions that they feel inside you can you know help bring the positive self-care in them mm. so you can you know run with them go dancing go singing or even you know playing with the dogs at home <laughs> it's very effective oh good excuse i'm gonna yeah. tell my wife i'm gonna need some dogs in the house <laughs> yeah I gotta tell my husband yeah. to come and bring my cats into the house. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I guess that's a lot as, as parents, and I, my, obviously my kids are not mm -hmm. old enough yet, but there is that tendency mm -hmm. sometimes if a kid is uh, thoughts or behavior is not in line with what you do, yep. you wanna discipline or you wanna do something to reprimand them, but in fact what you should do is just embracing them and trying to understand them, so that's yeah. a good point. Mm -hmm. But la uh, lastly, Rachel, mm -hmm. in case somebody is watching this that mm -hmm. is kind of like can relate to some of these feelings, what would you have to say to uh, young ones out there, especially like preteens and teenagers who have thought about doing this or even worse, who have done this before, what would you say to them? So I would say that, hey, I know you're going through a tough time, but you're definitely not alone. I understand how it feels, but it's not too late and you've been strong all this time. And, you know, seeking help is not a weakness it's mm. not an act of weakness it's a, an act of strength because you're caring for yourself and if you need any professional help you can you know holler at me you can call me <laughs> awesome. and you know people are here to help you perfect you know what i think my inner child just reacted to your statement <laughs> Thank you so much, Rachel. I think Thank it's, you, uh, Rachel. I, I really hope that that message hasn't just no reached even one person and that has uh, made our, our time here worthwhile. It's always great catching oh, up with you, Rachel. It's my honor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I hope we have you back in the studio again soon. Thank you, Rachel. Yes. All right. Thank you so much, guys. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye. You too. Bye.